I'm going to start the recording and um, wanted to talk to you uh, this week and thank you for joining basically. Um, thanks Jim, hi to you as well. Um, to talk a little bit about the um, AB 798 RFP campus plan and that is part of the uh, submission process uh, uh, that will be due sometime in June. So, um, let's, and I'm Nesta Kennedy and I'm the uh, Director of Affordable Learning Solutions in the CSU and, and I'm helping out um, the California Council. Um, I'm kind of the, one of their background folks that helps them out um, as a co-principal investigator to the grant funding and have been working with them all along. So, um, oh. I'm just playing with my mouse. There we go. Okay, it's back. So, um, um, so I'm very involved with this a whole AB 798 stuff, and we're excited that you're participating. And hopefully, we'll be able to answer all your questions today. So feel free to type them in the chat room, or um, and then I'll get to them if I see them. If not, by the end of the webinar, I'll do that. So the AB 798 uh, campus plan, RFP campus plan, is a template that we've posted on the um, coolfored.org site. And what I'm going to do is share my screen because I think that will be a better view of um, the template as opposed to my screenshots that are on my presentation. So um, now you should be seeing my screen. And um, this is a link. I can see a bunch of you are on the site. And it's linked to um, uh, the coolfored.org page. And if Teresa, if you're available, if you could copy the link of the RFP and the actually the campus plan link, uh, Google link into the chat room, I'd appreciate that very much. Okay, so um, just to point out a few things, at the very bottom of the spreadsheet are eight tabs. And I was working with someone today who said, "Wow, um, it seems like this campus plan is very simple. It, um, it's not. There's not a whole lot of information that I need to turn in." And I said, well, when you fill out the eight tabs, then it's a, possibly a different story. And she said, what? Eight tabs? I didn't even notice <laughs> eight tabs. So yes, this campus plan um, template has multiple tabs on it. Um, we're interested in seeing uh, you fill out as much of these, uh, the information that's on these tabs as possible. So let's go over them. That's what we'll do in this webinar. Um, the first tab is the overview tab, and basically it's all about campus readiness. It's about you thinking through what, what your objectives are for this project and uh, what your measures of success are going to be. Again, we're not going to hold you to these uh, measures of success, but this is a great w uh, planning exercise to think about what would, what would your campus think is a measure of success with regards to receiving funding from the state to help uh, lower the uh, course materials cost for your students. And could that mean that more students are taking the courses uh, because they have more funds? Or could it mean that uh, um, uh, students are saving significant amounts of money? Um, you know, all of those things can be measures of success. And this is really, like I said, an exercise for you to think through um, what they might be for your project. Campus readiness, as I mentioned, is another thing to think about when you're putting together a project like this. And then also some of the challenges that you might encounter um, through this process. And this, this is really just an exercise of planning, and it's not something we're going to hold you to. So um, you might not be able to think of all the campus challenges that you could encounter or some of the campus readiness issues that you need to think about ahead of time. Again, this is just a, a way for you to uh, consider and show the folks who are evaluating your campus plan, which will be the California OER Council once you submit it, um, that you have thought through these critical elements in a, a when one is implementing a project. All right, and there's no correct answer, by the way. I think I made that clear. Um, so I'm looking at tab number two, and it's the project team. So the AL, the the uh, RFP requires that there is a coordinator designated for each campus. That will be the person who helps organize um, and then also distribute information and funding. Um, so that person, we'd like to know who that will be. We leave a couple lines here in case you um, decide to do a dual role. But what we're really highly recommending is that it be a single uh, person so that um, there's no confusion on your campus or within your campus. 
this is if you're doing a multi-campus project. So, um, but there is the opportunity for you to possibly put together a working group that will help um, with the implementation. Well, first of all, the, the, um, the application process, the thinking through the process of this um, uh, RFP uh, submission, and then also the implementation. So that can be anybody that's interested on your campus, and it could be a constituent from your student side, from your faculty side, from staff, combination of all, which would be great, and um, maybe representing key areas on your campus, such as your library, your bookstore, your academic technology group, help desk, um, if they're the same, one and the same, or your faculty development group, or your students with disabilities group. Um, any or all of those folks on a, some sort of a project team would be recommended, but not required. So just think, telling us who, who could be working on this project is what we're interested in. And then maybe thinking through who your project partners may be. So perhaps one of those constituents I just mentioned would not be interested in participating regularly, but definitely wants to be uh, 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 involved with understanding what the project is all about and getting updates along the way. Um, that could be a project partner. And uh, um, so uh, that could be your fiscal officer, because someone needs to know that you're going to be receiving funds, your campus, once you are awarded the, the uh, grants, that this money is, are going to be transferred. And then you know who's going to receive those, and then how are those going to be disseminated. Um, that could be a project partner. Or as I scroll down this page, we also are seeing the project governance structure. Who are your executive sponsors on your campus? And um, the Academic Senate plays a large role, and so they are definitely an executive sponsor in that they're helping to uh, to pass the Academic Senate resolution um, that's required as a part of the RFP. But also, it could be your fiscal officer who is going to be receiving the funds and needs to be aware of that there's funding, that you're doing this and that you're going to be receiving funding and how that's going to be distributed. It could be your president. It could be your vice president of instruction. It could be your dean of students. Um, you know, any number of uh, folks in your governance structure that uh, where it would be wise to alert them. And there's no right answer here, because every campus is different, and you can add additional rows if needed. But um, this is just, again, a planning document for you to show the committee that you are, um, you've thought through some of these um, issues and that um, you all will be prepared for the dissemination of the funds. So the next tab I'm clicking on, Communications and Outreach, is all about that, in that um, if you uh, thinking through who you might need to contact or who are the potential stakeholders in this project and how will you contact them and or notify them in regards to uh, workshops or announcements about the RFP or um, you know, including the students and, and uh, possibly uh, making sure that they're very well aware and, and trying to get them to be advocates as well. Um, there, there's a myriad of options here. And so on this uh, spreadsheet, we list you know, potential stakeholders, right? We're not saying that you have to uh, address all of these, and some of these roles might not even be on your campus, but um, just scrolling through them. Um, I probably shouldn't scroll through too much because the system doesn't handle scrolling very well. But you can scroll through. I can see you're on the website as well. Um, all these different roles, and you know, select the ones that you think are going to be vital in regards to communicating and uh, uh, this, the information about this um, this uh, RFP, whether it's part of the announcement part or part of the implementation. And you can see there the um, key aspects could be the timing of it when you do actually implement the RFP and or the workshops, because a lot of the workshops have to do with professional development. I mean, a lot of the funding has to do with professional development, or thinking through um, why you would contact some of these stakeholders and what your desired outcome would be from that. Okay. So again, no right answer. Don't have to fill in all the roles, just helping you with that planning portion. Oh, and um, one thing I want to point out, it's back to project team and communications and outreach. If you go to, and Teresa will um, please copy the toolkit number one that's on the coolfored.org site, she's going to copy toolkit number one into the chat room. And that toolkit that's been developed by the California OER Council provides lots of resources that can help you with communication. It talks about what is OER. It talks about, um, you know, 
what, um, how that kind of that advocacy information that might be of help to all of you as you're considering some of your communication um, strategies. So take a look at Toolkit One, um, either now during the webinar or after the webinar, and it's located in step number one on the CoolForEd.org site under the RFP. So I just clicked on the next tab, and that's the training and professional development plan aspect of it. And you know, as I said earlier, um, there is a lot of uh, training that can be involved in this um, or this implementation of the of AB 798. And so, thinking through, what are you going to do? Are you going to, and who are your stakeholders going to be, and what kind of topics are you going to cover, and are you going to do training face to face, or are you going to do one on one mentoring in office hours, which I highly recommend, by the way. Um, or you know, and then uh, when is this going to happen, and who's going to be participating in this, and what's going to be your measurement of your success? Again, these are just planning pieces. Um, these things can change, but it's really a good idea to think this through ahead of time before you apply for the funds, so that you realize what kind of resources you're going to need, and also indicate to the the committee that's going to be evaluating your proposal. Um, that you've um, considered some of these areas. And I just scroll down a little bit to show you the stakeholders, potential stakeholders. And we have all faculty, which is a possibility. Um, although those workshops can be very generic and sometimes not very well attended in some places, but um, possibly highlighting certain departments or colleges or divisions on your campuses if you think they're going to be interested and in participating. So, um, if you know, for example, a chemistry um, course and multiple sections that are thinking about adopting the OpenStax College book, for example, um, you could maybe do a specific workshop for them to show them what resources may be available. Um, in addition to OpenStax College, there's a great um, website developed and supported by the Hewlett Foundation called PHET. It's P-H-E-T, coming out of University of Colorado Boulder, and they have great um, uh, um, simulations for chemistry, physics, and some math courses, I think, as well. So, you know, maybe just introducing those to the faculty and showing them that there are quality resources available um, and as you're trying to look for folks to participate in your um, that proposal. Or once you are working with them, also doing some develop uh, workshops on how to. Um, uh, how to find resources or implement them into their courses. How do you redesign a course around a new new textbook, an open textbook, a digital device, uh, a digital resource, sorry. Um, so around that, you might want to look at toolkit number two that's on coolfored.org. And um, uh, actually, I can flip over to that too because I have this open. So in toolkit two, you'll see that there are resources available that have been compiled by the California OER Council that are sample professional development workshop uh, formats. And there are also some topics here. So depending on what you're going to do for professional development, whether or not it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether or not it's going to be in a focused um, department or all faculty, that we've included that, um, those kinds of resources to help you get started on the um, toolkit number two, which is in, uh, located on the coolsforad.org site. So that could help you as you're uh, developing this campus plan document as well, to look there and see, hmm, well, these are good. Maybe I could do this, this, and this. Okay, again, this is all planning. We just want to see that you're thinking about it. If something changes, let's say a department walks up to you and you know, after you turn in your submission and says, we want to do this and you haven't included them, that's fine. Um, you just suggest for that and uh, and then that might even give you more numbers or or it will help you um, uh, meet your goals in other ways. Okay. All right, so now I'm clicking on the next tab, which is help and support services. And so another thing aspect to think about with your implementation and planning for your implementation is to what kind of support is available on your campus. And maybe that they need to be aware of this um, this activity, this project implementation. For example, the help desk. Are the faculty going to be going there for assistance? Are the students going to be calling them and say, I don't know how to um, use this digital book? 
um, there are lots of uh, different aspects to technical support and um, planning for that that are um, listed here. And so as you scroll down, you can also see uh, we've listed some stakeholders and uh, areas that you can consider uh, thinking about what work would work best for your institution, your campus. And on that note, I'm going to flip back over to toolkit number two, because one other thing we've got on here that is fantastic, I think, if I can find it. Yes, I'm scrolling down, and there it is. It's highlighted in yellow on toolkit number two, and it's called Reading on, on Electronic Devices, a Tutorial. And this was created by one of the California Council uh, OER Council faculty, and it's a video that um, is uh, has various addresses the aspects, and you can see as I scroll down, of what it's like to use an electronic device or a digital device. And one of the things we need to pay attention to in this project, if you haven't already on your campus, is that you know most free and or open text or resources are digital, and that a lot of our students have not had experience using digital. Um, we, if you look at our white paper, which is um, maybe eventually Teresa can put that in the chat as well. But in the white paper, we did some focus groups with students in the community colleges and the CSU, and asking them what they thought about open textbooks and, and uh, digital resources. And um, we got uh, quite uh, uh, positive feedback from several of the students, especially in the community colleges, who feel comfortable using digital resources, especially if it's saving money. And so. Um, but to assume that all of our students are comfortable using a digital a book or article um, is uh, probably not a good idea. And so possibly including some sort of training or link to this website for your faculty to become aware of the fact that they should be, um, they should maybe even incorporate a half hour tutorial in their first day of their course if they're using a digital device to talk about, or I keep saying device, I'm sorry, um, resource, um, that uh, to talk about what it's like to be able to link to it and um, uh, download it and use it to, for note taking if there's a, that tool is available or or um, for uh, you know um, highlighting um, depending on that device uh, the resource that you that you um, select and utilize. So um, that is highly recommended, and it's the um, reading on electronic devices that's been created by Diego Bonilla. He's a professor at Sac State, and that's his area of expertise is digital literacy. Um, so we're very lucky to have him part, uh, in this on the council, and that he also created this tutorial. And by the way, it's CC BY, so SA, meaning that you can use it and remix it and do all you want with it, but just have to provide attribution to Diego and also share it alike, meaning that it needs to be shared in a similar format. Um, and if you have any questions about how uh, this licensing is uh, set up, um, visit the Creative Commons site and look up what they say about CC by SA. Not difficult, all open. We want to share as much as possible, and it's a great resource. So that kind of fits into health and support services, thinking about also that your students and faculty uh, might not be necessarily comfortable with digital resources and to help them get there. Um, and one more thing, uh, we've got a lot of faculty showcases on the um, coolfored.org site, and there are actually a few more, it's quite a few more that are going to be posted by the end of this week, I promise you. I've been saying that for a while, but um, we, we got a response on that today. So, but the point is, I've read through all these faculty showcases, and it's the stories of their adoption of open educational resources. And some of the faculty said they didn't really know how to use um, digital um, textbooks. And some of them weren't even aware of the fact that they could uh, link them into their LMS, so their, Beach, their Blackboard or Moodle sites or Etudes or whatever you're using. So um, that would also be something that would be important to help a faculty member understand, and because that's going to serve the students um, really well if the students can get access to those resources directly from an easy place, such as the LMS, which most students are logging into um, uh, regularly. All right, so I'm moving over to the next tab on the campus plan and reporting template, and that tab is the discovery to distribution tab. And so here we're also asking you to think about how you're going to find, organize, acquire the digital and print versions of the course materials that you're considering using in this proposal. So you know that can be a bit of a challenge, and that's why if I'm going to scroll down here. Um, we're going to show you some of the examples 
uh, and potential stakeholders to help out with this discovery process, discovery to distribution. So, you know, on the coolforad.org site, there are a lot of open textbooks for 50 courses um, are made available, and then also all the faculty reviews of those books are there. So um, they're, that's a great resource where to start to find um, uh, uh, potential uh, course materials for your plan. And then there's always the Merlot.org site, and there could be other ones such as the Open Textbook Network from Minnesota or the OER Commons site. Lots of resources out there to find um, materials. And then um, uh, you can also uh, look at some of these examples up here on the, on the site, um, such as how you uh, link uh, faculty resources into the LMS. Um, we highly recommend you talking with your bookstore. Um, in the CSU, I can only speak for that right now, but in the CSU, our bookstores are super primed to help out with this. And if you have a Barnes and Noble or a um, Follett store on your campus in the community colleges, they've been primed as well because we work with them pretty closely because a lot of them are a lot of our campuses use them in the CSU. Not all, but a lot. And so they are familiar with this RFP, and they should be able to help you also possibly find faculty because they're the ones that are the experts on content in some ways and what faculty are purchasing or ordering for their, for their courses. And so they might be able to help you find faculty that they know of that, are, that are, might be more open to digital resources and or um, you know, departments that have been asking about just um, discounted books, and so maybe um, they'll say, well, you know, this department's been interested in us um, finding even lower cost resources. Um, perhaps they would be a good uh, a department or a group of faculty to, to approach to see if they want to um, participate in this RFP. And uh, so bookstores are a great resource for that, for discovery, and they're also a great resource for production because in addition to the fact that I mentioned that some folks are not comfortable in the digital environment, there are actually some folks that are not in, going to be interested in digital and want to have their book in a text or their resource in a print format. So the text, the bookstores um, will have resources, whether they can do, they have a print shop that they use or they can recommend um, for, uh, for uh, the faculty and or you to coordinate um, possibly once you select the books and then have a sense of what you're going to use, um, could provide a print copy version in their stores at a reduced rate. Obviously, if it's print and they've printed it, it's not going to be a full, um, a very expensive resource. And um, you'd be surprised how many students will buy it. In fact, we've seen many bookstores in the CSU who carry a print version of a free digital book and sell more of that book, the print version of a free book, than they ever sold of the book that was selected before. Because usually that print version of a digital book, an OER, is much less expensive than the original book that was um, utilized previously. And so um, it's actually a win-win for the bookstores and then also for the students. So that's uh, just a comment on that, and uh, and the reason why you might want to oops I went too fast here uh, uh, you know work oh, this is not working very well here uh, you may want to work with your bookstore, and then we have some examples of who the stakeholders may be in regards to discovery, the distribution, the librarians. Oh my gosh, that's another area that's huge. Um, in your you know all of your campuses have some sort of like digital library database. And um, the reference librarians um, uh, can help you also find uh, resources that you're already paying for that are coming through your library databases. And, and then they can provide you the links that can be provided to those courses. And then that can also um, be that free resource that the instructors could um, uh, link to for their students to use. Um, and. Uh, um, so I highly, we, we, we highly recommend uh, checking in and working closely with your libraries or librarians um, because they are a great resource. And sometimes folks forget about their many digital, digital resources that they have um, available to them. 
Okay, so that's it for the plan for discovery. And let's go, I'm going to click this next arrow, and then it comes up with the rest of these tabs that some people aren't noticing, so I'm making a point of uh, showing these to you. Um, and this tab talks about, have you thought about the technologies and the facilities and the policies and resources? Now again, there's not an answer for all of these, but it's something to think about. What are the te technology requirements? For example, um, do you need to talk to your LMS administrator, your Blackboard or Moodle or Etudes administrator? Just let them know that their faculty are going to be trying to link um, uh, textbooks or uh, articles from the library into the LMS. They might still be using some publisher materials that could be linked in through a direct linkage through what they call LTI um, integration that uh, eliminates the need for using a secondary password. So probably something to think about, that those people can be a crucial element to your implementation. Um, if you have a portal, some other things like that, that would be also something that you would want to talk to the appropriate people about. And then facility requirements. Um, you, you know, there's possibility that um, you might set up something special for this activity, or you need to find um, a designated room for your workshops or something like that. So, um, something to think about: facility requirements, policy requirements. You know, make sure you're aware of your academic freedom policies and you know shared governance, all those kinds of activities on your campuses, um, because uh, this is all about faculty ha still having a choice. Um, if, and not being required to participate in this and um, to be uh, interested in being, uh, participating as much as possible. And then also any accessibility policies that you'll want to make sure that uh, you address and also including the, the students with disabilities program or office into this discussion is really important so that they're aware that there might be more digital resources being utilized and um, perhaps some of their students will come to them for assistance with those as well. Um, we will be soon posting a big review that we did of all the OER textbooks on coolfored.org, the accessibility reviews we've done recently, um, and uh, so that will be of, uh, might be of interest to your folks as they and or you all when you're deciding what books you want to adopt, depending on the the feedback that we provide through those reviews. And at the very bottom of this um, tab, the text facility policy resources tab is a place where you can also think about how you're going to you know, utilize staff or students or professional development workshops, stipends, recognition events, which we highly recommend actually, is to include a recognition event um, at the end of the year to give out certificates um, to those faculty who participated and, and that you know, raises a, a level of awareness to other faculty and also you know, rein, uh, reinforces the value to the faculty for having participated in this activity. So what you estimate the cost may be, all that kind of stuff you can put in here. And at the very bottom, I think we have a link to um, or a tally of the, those numbers, um, which might help you with your planning, total grant funds requested there. And so, but the biggest one for funding and planning is probably the last tab, which is the savings and progress report tab. And, and on here we have some examples. You've probably already seen them. There are about five examples. The first four are examples of uh, that would be um, acceptable with regards to what you're doing in, re uh, in regards to saving money for the students. The last example is a good example. If I recall correctly, let me just make sure. I'm, yeah, uh, the uh, row 11, I guess, is the example of something that is not saving 30 percent. Um, so it would give you a sense of um, that, that 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 scenario that's here, where a book for all the total course materials originally cost forty dollars, the book was thirty and the workbook was ten, and the instructor decides to or the sections decide to eliminate the workbook but keep the thirty dollar textbook. That's not going to be a thirty percent saving, so that's not a scenario that's going to be um, acceptable. But on these other examples, you can see where either an instructor selected a, um, a completely free book, and so that's you know, saving lots of money and funds. And um, uh, then also the pre-calculus for engineering. Um, faculty member used uh, originally a $90 book with a $30 online homework system, and then um, they uh, substituted the $90 book um, but kept the $30 online homework system 
and uh, then that shows about 75% savings. So those are what this is a this um, spreadsheet is what you'll be filling out. Um, it could be several sections, or it could be one course with just a few sections. So hang on just a minute. Someone just came into my conference room, and I need to talk to them. I'll be right back. And if you have any questions, please ask. So while she's gone, let me introduce myself. My name is Catherine Harris. I'm chair of the California OER Council. I'm just sitting in and listening. I've been over and playing with the template as well, because what we'll be doing is norming all of the council members and showing them this uh, campus plan and reporting template so we can make some good decisions when everybody submits their proposals on June 30th. I think Leslie's back now, so back with me. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, someone, we have these meeting rooms in the chancellor's office and someone else wanted to use it. So, Anyway, um, thanks, Kathy, for sharing that information. Yeah, and I forgot to introduce the folks that are on the call. Kathy is the chair of the California OER Council and has helped um, coordinate all of this um, project and the, and the toolkits and, and so on and so forth. So uh, um, she's very much involved. And then Teresa Dykes is on the call is also our coordinator and, um, and administrative specialist, so she's also very actively involved and probably the person that, if you email sometimes, she's the one that responds. So back to this, uh, this, this spreadsheet, um, what we're asking you to include is, um, if I scroll back up really fast, is the course name, the course section or number, and um, someone asked in a previous webinar today uh, whether and this is for the CSU. Don't feel badly that you missed it, but um, uh, you know maybe they won't know what the section number is right now for a course that's next spring. Um, so just you know make, kind of make it up. Like if you know you're going to do four sections of a stats course, just say section one, two, three, four. Um, you know, uh, if it turns out to be section 10, 11, 12, 13, you can put that in your progress report at the end. I'm not, we're not worried about that. Estimated students, again, usually, you know, you, the course usually carries maybe 50 or 100. Just put an estimated number. We're not going to hold you to that. Psych department, usually that's good to know. That will probably be something you should know ahead of time. And then what the total cost of the materials are um, from your local bookstore. So, you know, don't go on Amazon and find out what that total cost of the course materials pre-RFP cost because sometimes you'll find less expensive resources there. You might want to find out what the bookstore has been charging so that you have problems. That's the, that's the number that we'd like you to go with, like a brand new book off of um, the bookstore. So let's say this stats book cost 150 And so then that meant that 50 students paid about 7500 Originally, this is pre-RFP. And then um, what term that the OER will be adopted? We're assuming it will be spring. And um, estimated total cost of course materials with adoption of OER. So let's say this course selected the Intro to Stats book um, from OpenStax College. That means zero dollars. And then um, so that would be zero uh, savings of 7,500. Um, which is 100% savings. Okay. So we have other examples here. Seems like they're repetitive, actually. Not sure why we have so many. I need to probably fix that. I think somebody's edited this. <laughs> need to fix it. Anyway, so um, hopefully that, that uh, answers some of your questions. Let me um, pop over to the room and see if I can get the chat room back up and see what um, questions. Maybe Kathy and Teresa have been answering them. Um, let's see, here's one from Jim. We have interest from faculty in implementing OER for the fall and would like the training options this summer that we could stipend, but we don't want to receiving funds until fall. Any recommendations? Good question, Jim. Well, um, yeah, so uh, we'd like to say that we'd have the funds out to you this summer, but um, you know, working um, with different systems and transferring funds and all that, sometimes we see, have seen some delays. So. Possibly what you could do is um, talk to your administration and say, you know, this is what we're doing. Um, could you front us the money and then you will receive the funds um, at a later date? Um, you know, it might be something that's incorporated into a grant that they could provide or um, your faculty development um, resources that you have could be also a place where you could find that, that, that those funds um, and then they will be um, uh, provided or made up to them once the funds are transferred in. 
not sure if that's the best answer, but I think that's the only one that I can think of. Um, if anybody else has something, maybe you could volunteer that as well. Okay. Um, here's another one. I'm going to take questions text box again. Yeah, so hopefully I responded to yours, and thanks for putting the links in. Um, yeah, so Jim, um, you know, uh, let me know. Oh, that's Jim Julius. Oh, I didn't realize that was Jim Julius. Hi, Jim. My buddy Jim. Um, so, uh, you know, let us know uh, if that's an issue with regards to uh, funding. Um, uh, you know, if your grant proposal so you're saying that you might not, you think you might, there's a possibility that you might not receive the funds. Well, um, what we really want to do is distribute these funds, this money. The state wants this to happen. We want it to happen. Um, I would imagine that if you kind of, you know, follow what we've been talking about today and, and some of the other, uh, the Academic Senate resolution has passed, um, you know, you can pretty much uh, count on those funds being distributed. Um, uh -huh. So I uh, grant is not guaranteed. Well, um, uh, you know, I would think that uh, um, very likely they would be. Yeah, it's a good point <laughs> for summer. But um, uh, you know, I, I'm short of saying um, that everybody's going to get the funds. Um, really, it, it does require that the um, that the, the campus has done some due diligence in their planning. And, um, and that would be filling out this campus plan template relatively um, thoroughly, um, showing that they are committed, um, then I can't imagine why they wouldn't receive the funds, to be honest with you. So hopefully that h helps with that aspect of it. Yes, the odds are extremely good. Yeah. Good. And you know, for all of you, um, so there's Jim here, and there's, uh, there's um, Cheryl and uh, let's see, Larry's here, and uh, from the community college is Suzanne, um, and possibly Tom. If you know that of um, your campus, if the, the Academic Senate has passed their um, campus resolution, if you could let me know and just send me a link to it, or Noah even, um, if you're from the CCC, um, I'll add it to our resources that we've got posted on our site, just to kind of let the other campuses see. Um, what the, uh, one another have passed so far. And if you look at the sites, and I'm going to click over to it right now, um, we've got um, links on a Google Doc for the type of resolutions that have passed already that I'm aware of. And that the California OER Council faculty put together a template and it's the one I'm pointing to right now, the CA CCC Textbook Affordability Information and Resolution Template. That is something that any community college can pick up and um, just fill in the blanks with their campus, and that could possibly be a resolution. Um, so that's, uh, I only have the answers. Um, that's just through Google search. So if at any point you all, if and when you pass your, and if you could share the link, um, I'll place it in this folder just to provide it as a resource. And, um, it could help some other um, C, uh, CCCs in their academic senate uh, resolution process. And uh, um, so let me see. I'm going to go back to illuminate and uh, stop sharing. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Um, just uh, I'm going to scroll over to that. I'm not going to go back to the sharing my document. But at the very end of that cost, Savings and Progress Report template on the far right is what we're expecting to see as a campus progress report um, in a year. So hopefully this will be um, something that you will also consider in your planning that will be interested in the actual cost of course materials and the actual cost savings and the estimated cost of print materials that the bookstore has um, provided. And hopefully that's also in the 30% mark an actual number of students have enrolled. Those are for our reporting purposes from the um, state requirements. So um, that would be something that you also might plan on as you're working on this uh, this um, project. So let's see. Um, yeah, if you're looking for assistance with um, uh, to look at your um, campus plan as you're developing it, you can. Uh, Send it to um, 
uh, tool for ed at cdl.edu, or uh, I see that uh, let's see, Kathy put a link into the chat, and that goes to a Google Doc um, where you can also get information. So either way, we all work together, Kathy, Teresa, and I, um, and the campus plans, if they come in for review, will be shared amongst ourselves. Um, for any kind of feedback, and we're we're here to help you. We want you to be successful, and um, we we uh, highly encourage you to do that. Um, so Jim says, so it's expected that we just copy the template, literally fill it in. Yep, and you can uh, download it. Uh, you can download it from Google, this Google site uh, as a Excel spreadsheet, and then um, you can turn it in as a Google Doc if you like, Jim. Um, or um, or just save it as an Excel spreadsheet and attach it. And what we will be doing is making a website available that will accept RFP submissions. That's via this software where we call it's called InfoReady, and uh, we're hoping we need to have that up and running possibly by tomorrow or the next day. And basically, it'll be just um, uh, setting up a password to get into InfoReady. Uh, filling out the fields, you know who the coordinator is, their contact information, and then attaching an uh, example, uh, uh, not not example, attaching the academic senate resolution, either as a PDF or or copying and pasting the link to where it's posted on the campus website, and then also um, uh, attaching or linking to the um, campus template plan template. Um, and um, just because Google can change and be edited, um, we, and we probably don't want it to be edited after the um, the deadline, most likely it will be recommended that you download your Google template and um, make it an Excel spreadsheet and attach it to the um, to the InfoReady submission site. And there's, so there are three documents that we're going to be looking for. Uh, or link. Uh, first link is or document is the academic senate resolution that's approved. It can't just be a resolution that's not been approved. We, um, the, the the legislature wanted an approved senate resolution. Um, the campus plan uh, template. Um, don't have to call it that. Just call it the campus plan. And then the last one is that the academic senate has to approve the academic the campus plan. And so. Um, They'll need to include possibly you'll need to include a separate doc just with one or two lines that say I approve of this temp this campus plan and have the, either the Senate president or some designee in the Senate or the Senate can designate someone else to sign it and uh, and just include that so we know that that's been approved as well um, and that's all outlined in the RFP there are some examples of who you can uh, use to approve the campus plan so hopefully that won't be too confusing. Uh, let's see. All right, Kathy's talking about our next webinar. And uh, so, any other questions that you may have? Um, and, and I'm hoping, um, are all of you planning to submit um, a, uh, a proposal? Um, so, we're looking at Tahoe Community College here that's on the call, um, um, San Francisco State, Miracosta, um, Coastline. And those are the ones that I know. Butte. Um, not sure where, what other campuses you all are from. You could maybe you could click the green check mark um, in the, underneath the, where your name is. There's a polling feature, and if you click the green check mark, that would be great. Great, Larry. Great. Glad you're planning to uh, submit. And any questions, let me know. Uh, or let us know. We'd be happy. We want to make sure that you're successful. Yeah. Leslie, and, um, I have a specific okay. question. For those of us that are um, that have an AIM RFP, the template looks pretty similar. <laughs> so would it be okay if we borrowed from our AIM um, strategic planning because we have at San Francisco State, I think we have a pretty robust plan in place. So could I borrow a little from that for the AB 797 template? Of course. Yes, you can. Yes. And just uh, for others, um, uh, that's Monica from San Francisco State. And in the CSU, we provide grants every year for affordable learning solutions. And the CSU has just turned in their grant proposal last week, or April 1st. And uh, um, we use a similar template for that. So um, yes, uh, please do. So great. So I'm looking at NOAA's planning, too. I'm not sure what campus you're from, NOAA. But please let us know. 
if you have any questions, and I see Butte's doing it as well, Suzanne, great. Um, and, and Jim is, and Cheryl, Coastline, great. All right, well, this is exciting, and uh, we just want you to be as successful as possible. So please um, let us know, and uh, if you need any assistance, and um, and because um, our goal is to give out all the money <laughs> this year, um, and so hopefully we can do that. And uh, so um, um, let us know at any point in time before you turn it in June 30th if you have any questions. And thank you for participating in this webinar. And I'm going to turn off the recording.